This is 50 Feminist States, a road-tripping storytelling podcast visiting all 50 U.S. states to interview feminist activists and artists about their work for gender justice. I'm Amelia Ruby, and this week we're in North Dakota and the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. Everything came out of the camp. Standing Rock became an anomaly. Sweden, Norway, Finland, Greenland, Paris. They have signs in their yard in every country we went to. Everywhere I go, people say Lakota words. Miniwachoni waters life. Hi everyone, Amelia here, your tour guide, host, wanderer, listener, guiding us on this 50 Feminist States journey. I am so thankful for all of you who have listened to the first episodes of season one of 50 Feminist States, and I wanted to let you know that I'm actually back out on the road traveling and doing interviews for season two. Two. Over 100 amazing Kickstarter backers helped fund season one, but I could use more listener support to help cover expenses as I'm traveling and producing for season two. So if you have anything to share, you can do that at 50feministstates.com slash support. I also have some kick-ass t-shirts and tote bags available. You can find those at 50feministstates.com slash shop. And those purchases help me stay on the road and keep doing this work as well. Thank you so much for listening. This week, we are in North Dakota, and we're going to get back on the road. Whenever I think of North Dakota... I think of iconic humorist Dave Barry's 2001 column, where he talks about North Dakotans petitioning to remove North from their name. He says they want to do it because the North in North Dakota makes the state sound too cold and undesirable, particularly in comparison to the sunny-sounding shores of South Dakota just below them. I know it's meant to be a joke, but jokes tend to be funny because there's a little bit of truth in them. And to be honest, I do definitely do think of cold weather and flat, barren land when I think of North Dakota. I'm here to say, though, that that impression is totally wrong. In fact, North Dakota is the nation's largest producer of sunflowers. So if you go there during the summer, it becomes this huge expanse of beautiful yellow blooms reaching toward the sky. That's how I'll remember North Dakota from now on. Not cold weather or flat land, but beautiful sunflowers. And this association of North Dakota with its crops makes sense. The North Dakota Coat of Arms reads strength from soil, and the women we'll hear from in today's episode have grown strong by planting themselves in North Dakota's land. This episode is maybe a little different than previous episodes, and that I didn't speak to anyone who identifies as being quote-unquote from North Dakota. Our first conversation is with LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, a member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, who was the founder of the Sacred Stone Camp during the recent Dakota Access Pipeline protests. While her people's land straddles North and South Dakota, they are a sovereign nation that works to maintain little contact with the white world that surrounds them so as to preserve their cultural heritage. The second conversation of this episode is with Wiljar Ajuro, an African-American woman from New York who moved to North Dakota five years ago and is now the current Miss North Dakota International. She also works at North Dakota's only women's health clinic offering abortion services. In the last episode about Montana, I discussed how people often perceive that state, and I think this general region, to be completely white, erasing the people of color who do live in these areas. This episode brings them to the forefront, perhaps rightfully eclipsing the white populations of this state with these stories of the strength of indigenous and African-American folks there. We'll hear from LaDonna first. My name is LaDonna Brave Bull Allard. My real name is Tamaka Washtewi, her good earth woman. I'm enrolled member of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. I am Ihunkdoana Pabiska and Sitan Dakota. I'm Hunkpapa Sihasapa and Oguala Lakota. I was born about four blocks from where I'm living right now, and I grew up across the street from where I'm living today. And we are on Standing Rock. We're 2.3 million acres. We're the fifth largest land-based tribe in the United States. We are in compass of the Lakota, Dakota people. On the North Dakota side, we have the Ihunkdoana, the Pabaska, and the Hunkpatina. And on the South Dakota side of Standing Rock, we have the Hunkpapa and Sihasapa Lakota. We are divided between two counties, Sioux and Corson County. And... 
we are some of the people that have not had contact for a very long time. I think our contact has been 125 years. And for me, so you're sitting here in this little community called Fort Yates, North Dakota. We're kind of in a peninsula, I guess they would call. We're covered by water on all three sides and one road in. That happened because the Army Corps flooded us in the 1950s and 60s. I remember the land and what it looked like before. And if you're not from here, you don't know that the Cheyenne were camped over here in the 1400. You know that the Arikara were down there, um, close to the Grand, and they came in in the 1500s. We know that we have been on this land for 10,000 years. Of course, we were here in the Americas longer, but 10,000 years here in this spot. Before 10,000 years, this was all a great sea called Lake Agassiz from the glacier melt that extended from Winnipeg all the way to Kansas. So the middle of America was underwater. And as soon as the water subsided, we moved into these areas. The history of the Standing Rock Sioux Nation, as LaDonna attests, is rich, deep, and strong. But until recently, many people on and off the reservation didn't know much about it. Hear LaDonna speak to her work recovering that history and sharing it with her community. I'm a tribal historian and genealogist. I really spent majority of my time in documents and books and research. I worked for the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, the Tribal Tourism. I did historic tours, historic lectures, and just compiled history for people. And so that's basically what I did mostly all my life for 27 years. When I was in college, I just had so many unanswered about my own history. And so I started just digging, digging, and just became obsessed. And when I graduated from college, I came back to the tribe here, and they had a job opening called the Cultural Resource Planner. And so I applied for it. And through there, developed the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Office, and just started compiling history. Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, we have amazing history. We're the people of Sitting Bull and Gall and Grass and Rain in the Face. We have a very strong lineage. And when I looked at the kids in the school, because there was a time when we had a high suicide rate, I would ask the kids, you know who you are? And it seems like when they realize who they were, what their descendancy was, it went, oh, and a whole different attitude came out of them. And I realized that helping people find out who their center is, who are they, is the key to solving a lot of the problems we have. If you know your history, your culture, your language, your tradition, your way of life, again, you are a whole person. And so my dream is my people become whole people again. And once you know those, you can follow it or not follow it. It doesn't matter. You're already a whole person. This sense of being whole is as deeply rooted in the Standing Rock Sioux tribe history as it is in their land. Or perhaps I should say that their history is a history of the land as much as it is a history of the people. Either way, both were threatened in recent years when an underground oil pipeline was approved for construction only half a mile from the Standing Rock Sioux lands, putting their water supply at risk of devastatingly adverse effects. In April 2016, LaDonna established the Sacred Stone Camp as a space of cultural preservation and spiritual resistance to the pipeline. This camp attracted thousands of people, including representatives from more than 200 tribal nations, and the Dakota Access Pipeline protests gained national and international attention. Here LaDonna speak to how it changed her life. Everything came out of the camp. Standing Rock became an anomaly where everywhere you can drive down in a road in Paris in an old farmhouse and they have many Wachoni we stand with standing rock in their windows. They have signs in their yard in every country we went to. Sweden, Norway, Finland, Greenland. Everywhere I go, people say Lakota words, many Wachoni, water is life. So yes, Even though we only had 15,000 people on the ground living at the camp, and we only had 100,000 that came and stood with us, every keyboard warrior, everybody across the world heard us. Standing Rock became a seed, and that's all it was, was a seed. 
Everything that happened here was supposed to happen. And all it is is seed spreading across the world, knowing that we have to change things. And the vision is to create this big tree of life so that we can live again on this earth. And so now as we're in the courts, we're fighting in the legal perspective now, but we're still fighting mm-hmm. and we're winning. And then with our divestment program, we said, well, what do you do with corporation? Oh, their lives are money. So then we started having grandma divest from any bank that finances fossil fuel. And so then we went to the countries and asked them to divest. And then we went to the cities and asked them, as you know, Los Angeles, New York, Seattle, Dallas have all divested. We went to Norway, Sweden, Finland, Switzerland, we're still fighting, uh, asking them to divest, Germany. And then now as the Mexican president just announced that he will no longer endorse fossil fuel in Mexico. And Portugal just announced their offshore drilling and fracking and will go to be a totally green environment. So is Greenland. Norway is heading that way. Finland, Paris, and France. China made a a declaration that they will no longer allow fossil fuel cars in their country. So things are changing. Even though they said it wouldn't happen. Even so, they said we couldn't fight a corporation. Even though they told us big money wins out all the time. Even though they told us we were fighting a government. All we need is one woman to stand up and say no. One of the reasons I wanted to speak with LaDonna was to learn more about the role of women in the Dakota Access Pipeline protests and the indigenous environmental movements that have grown from the camps. I couldn't tell from media coverage whether the emphasis on women in the camps was intentional on the part of indigenous communities organizing the movement, or whether it was a projection of Western feminists onto the events. LaDonna explains. We live in prophecy. We live in prayer and ceremony. And so we were told we are now stepping into the age of women. And it is the time for the women to stand up. Why? Water is life. What does that mean? Water is female. And so it is our requirement to stand up for water. Through water, we bring children into this world. Through water, we feed our families. Through water, life comes with the trees and the plants and the animals and the medicine. Through water, the rain comes to plenty the earth, our mother. Everything about water is female. It is our obligation to defend it. It is our obligation to fight for it. So we don't have a choice. We have to stand up for water. And so... When we spread the word about water, it is women who stood up everywhere because we have that connection to water. And so when we stood up, there was a lot of other people saying things. We have a lot of military people. We had a lot of veterans. We had a lot of churches from all over the world that came with different ideas. But we had some of the most amazing, strongest women you'd ever want to meet. I seen them every day in ceremony and prayer and singing and standing at the front line. Young ones, little girls, teenagers. I seen amazing warriors. So yes, there was a lot of movement by women. I learned from LaDonna that the movement certainly was led by women. But she was also very adamant that the leadership didn't come from the sort of feminist motivations that certain media coverage, or even my own project, might see in it. She attributed this to a fundamentally different construction of gender roles in indigenous communities, and she centered this in the role of the grandmother. I think, you know, in my whole life, my grandmother was the most important person. And no matter what I did, my grandma was always there to support me. And if you go around to talk to Native people who went to college, it was always the grandmas and grandpas who encouraged them. And so in Indian country, it's a big thing. And so being out there, standing up for a purpose, the grandparents' duty is to support the young people. Grandma's first job is, of course, making sure everybody eats, making sure people have food, and making sure they're warm and comfortable. You know, most of the Native tribes, I would say almost 90% are matrilineal and matrilarchal. 
And in my tribe, we are patrilineal, which means the children go down to the father's line. But the women own the homes and the property, and they own the produce. The men have their clothes, and the women make those clothes. But the men have a um, a very important part in our society. I didn't grow up with the idea of one sex better than the other, or one sex and injustice, or any of that. I grew up with the idea. I remember when I was young, and I was complaining. In my house, my father and my brothers all ate dinner. We would get their plates. We would cut their food up. We would get everything ready. And my dad and my brothers would sit down and eat. And then we would clean their plates. And then us girls would eat. And I would say, Grandma, why do we have this? You just started, you know. And she'd say, you be respectful. And she started telling me, she said, a long time ago in our villages, when a male baby was born and a female baby was born, the female baby would live and the male baby would die. When these boys that lived would get to a certain age, we would more likely lose them, whether it's through hunting or just because our lives are rough. Then you get to the age where they become warriors and and hunters. We're more likely going to lose them. And then you get a man to be middle age. He is more likely going to die of illness. And so if you have a man that makes it to elder stage, you honor them because they don't live long. And so my grandma told me this and I was like, well, okay. And she said, a long time ago in a village, an old man, an old lady would come out of their their home and he would sit her there in front of all the people who would comb her hair and braid her hair. And then when he was done, then she would get up and comb his hair and braid his hair. And all the young people would walk by and say, ah, I want to be like that. And the object of that story was grandma said, everybody deserves respect. If you don't give respect, you don't get respect. So if you honor and respect the men, the men will honor and respect you. And so that's how I was taught. I um, wasn't brought up in, in the area where men dominated the families men controlled, men did the discipline, men owned the property. So I I wasn't grown up in that kind of society. And so when I became a teenager, people were saying all these things, you know, women's lib, you got to stand up for your rights, you know, and I kept on thinking, well, what is my rights? And so it's a different, a whole different culture of, of things. No man has a right to tell a woman about her body. She knows that. And so in, I grew up with different, a different culture. There's still a lot of requirements, how we dress, how we act in public, how we do things. It's all about respect. What our positions in ceremony is compared to the men's position in ceremony. And they're not right or wrong. They are our positions. And these positions don't only look to the past. They also reach into the future. I'm in a a new phase in my life, which I'm not quite sure. I've now started this adventure of being a widow. My husband passed away six months ago. And so I'm still trying to figure that out because I never expected to live ever without him. But um, there are requirements that I have to follow. So I can't speak unless somebody asks me to speak. I can't grow in large crowds of people. I can't go to events, festivals, music events. You cut your hair. There are a lot of requirements in this new status. And I kind of think of it like an education stage. Where are you in your femalehood? Where are you in womanhood? What happens when you get to my age and my 60s? Where do we fit in the world? And so I've had a lot of questions about that. And then I came to the conclusion, well, okay, I'm old now, which means that I can be more daring, more brave, more fierce than anything that ever walked this earth. That means that I can change the world. And changing the world is what she's doing, whether it's at her home in Fort Yates that is always welcoming strangers from around the globe who seek out Standing Rock or on her travels to other countries to stand with widespread indigenous communities fighting against environmental destruction. 
how do you live on a planet? How do you make sure that seven generations from you are going to be fine? How do you make sure the next generation sees the same thing you see, lives the same way, and has the privilege to walk on this earth? Because the walk on this earth is a privilege. And I see people who disrespect the earth everywhere I go. And I keep on thinking, don't they love their children? Don't they love their grandchildren? Or they do they just dislike themselves? Because the greatest love anybody could have is for your surroundings and your future generations. So when they found out they were going to build a pipeline out of my home, um, we said no. How do we solve this thing? So then I started looking into green energy, solar, wind, thermal. How do we do this? So today that's what we're doing. We developed a, a solar trailer that's uh, wind, solar, water purification, and internet so we can pull in and plug in anywhere. We have um, looked at different housing structures that are more ecological friendly than some of the structures that we live in today. And telling everybody the first and foremost they have to do in this world, plant something. So we've planted trees, we've planted gardens, and then the second thing, pick up trash. And so we've had huge cleanups everywhere. Right now we're in the position where there are only 22% of the whole world that has native grasses, native plants, native medicines, native trees. And all of these areas seem to be in areas where indigenous people live. And then we go back to, we are down to less than 5% clear portable water. And we are in the largest extinction of animals. Up to 75% of our animals are going extinct as we sit here. And to me, that's a world crisis. And I, I tell people, are you comfortable? Then if you are comfortable, then you are in the wrong. You should be standing up. Otherwise, you're just killing the future of the young generation coming up. So we have all decided we talk to each other. We try to teach people our traditional knowledge of living on the earth, living with respect from the earth, and how to repair the earth. And so that is a big thing we're doing on the global scale. LaDonna's story, work, and life attest, as she says, to the power of one woman who stands up and says no. The strength of that woman's no is grounded in the long history of the land and community from which she comes or to which she chooses to belong. And it is powerful beyond measure. I want to turn now to the story of a woman who is still building her community and learning to become whole, as LaDonna put it earlier. Wiljar Ajuro is an African-American woman with Haitian and Kenyan heritage who grew up in New York, but has chosen to build her life in North Dakota. I got in touch with her because she works in North Dakota's only women's health clinic offering abortion services, the Red River Women's Clinic in Fargo. But our conversation didn't focus as much on reproductive rights as it did on feminist identity building. And that's what we'll hear from her about today. Here's Wiljar talking about her experience in North Dakota. So at a very young age, you know, you, you already see what you're facing up against and the assumptions just because of the color of your skin. So naturally, I had to kind of like build that wall at a very young age to really just set myself like, well, Jar, you know, don't forget who you are because these people see something totally different. And I never want to play into the stereotypical stigmas or anything like that. So moving to North Dakota um, back in 2014, I was alone. I don't have family here and I'm still alone here, but I would say racism is definitely real here. But had I not had the experience growing up of being the minority throughout everything that I do, I probably wouldn't have been able to handle it. Being here, it's really, it's done two things. It's helped me kind of express myself in a manner that surprises people because of who I am and what they see. Also, it makes me scared because I know when I leave North Dakota, I still have that wall up. And it's not fair because there's so many other states around that are more progressive and you don't have to think about things like that, you know? For one thing I would say here, it's stereotypical kind of thing. I would say it's good living here as an African-American here um, if you pick and choose the right path to go down. If you fall into the, you know, I'm not going to go to school, not going to get an education. I'm just going to, you know, follow with the crowd and do my own things. Then, yeah, it's going to be tough because 
you're only proving to them what they already think or assume about you. I, that's why I've always strived in life to just push myself further. Like my mother and my father, they never stop telling me that, Hey, you're an African American woman. You don't have these things that these other people have. So no matter what you do, you always have to push it even further. Like that's been ingrained in me. And so that's why I love pushing myself. I love getting involved. I love, you know, doing more than what people think I can do. And it just, I have to, I feel like I have to here because I don't want people to think that, you know, all African Americans are like this. I really appreciated Will Jar's candidness about the reality and weight of carrying people's expectations for a whole race on her own shoulders. This is one effect of marginalization and the reality of being one of few members of a group in any given place. Wiljar, however, has turned this pressure into a platform and embraced her opportunities to represent North Dakota, notably through her experience in pageants. You know, because before when I looked at pageantry, I thought, you know, you have girls who are size two, blonde hair, blue eyes. Those are the typical winners. And me, I'm completely on the opposite side of that. And so and I, I don't apologize for it. So I think it took time for me to just be like, suck it up, breathe and own who you are and do it. And not think about what you hear about it, the pros and cons, just walk in it being you. And I think it works out really well in that sense because you can make it different just by you being there. So yeah, sure enough, I love getting out of this North Dakota and going to like Georgia, for example, and wearing my sash and it says Ms. North Dakota, United States, because it brings up a conversation and I already know what's on their mind. It's like, wow, you know, they have a black girl like wow I didn't know this you know so it's kind of like yeah let's talk and you know that kind of destigmatizes in a way their idea their their thoughts of me and who I am and where I come from so yeah it's different it's um not something that I wear on my sleeve every day because that that that's not a life to live Pageants are a controversial feminist issue, with some people arguing that they empower the women they allow to compete, and others pointing out that only certain women are allowed to compete, and those restrictions tend to fall along pretty normative guidelines. Regardless of that fact, the pageant system has allowed Wiljar to represent North Dakota in a way that surprises other people and even herself. Wiljar also had thoughts on feminism in North Dakota and her own feminism. Feminism in North Dakota, I would say it's interesting being an African-American woman here because feminism here tends to single out the minority. And we have to remember it's not just me. It's Native Americans. It's Hispanic, Latinos, or however one chooses their preference. And just making sure that when you're fighting for rights, you're fighting for all women's rights. The whole feminism word tends to scare people being a feminist. It's like they think like anti-men kind of thing. I love being feminine. I embrace it. Wearing gowns all over the place, even when I don't want to. But it's it's just about accepting who you are and not letting society form you and shape you into who they think you should be and who they want you to be. So if you are for that, then yes, accept the word, embrace it. I am a feminist. What I loved about the conversations I had in North Dakota is that these women are at very different stages in their lives. They come from such different places and they have incredibly diverse perspectives. But they're both grappling with what it means to be a woman in North Dakota. And from their insights, we get to see the expanse of womanhood today and the challenge that feminism faces in trying to speak to, and perhaps even for, such different women and people of all genders. This is what North Dakota taught me, that the places we think of as the most barren are often the richest, and that the challenge of speaking to many becomes easier when we listen to just one. As always, you can find more information about the work that LaDonna and Wiljar are doing in the show notes at 50feministestates.com slash podcast. Otherwise, next episode, we'll travel south to South Dakota. Until then, I'll see you on the road. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of 50 Feminist States. You can follow 50 Feminist States to stay updated on episodes and road trip happenings on Instagram at 50 Feminist States. That's F-I-F-T-Y Feminist States. 
Our opening music is by Lobo Loco, and this wonderfully sexist song that you're listening to on our way out is a recording by Billy Murray from 1916. Special thanks go out to LaDonna and Will Jar for inviting me into their homes and showing me such different perspectives on North Dakota. I also have to thank the hundred or so Kickstarter backers who made funding this season possible. Until next time, wild ones, we'll see you on the road. With a wild, ferocious glance that pierced him like a lance, you made the grizzly bear get up and do the hula dance. But can you tame wild women? If you can, please tame my wife. 